Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm so pleased to see everyone brave the rain and the traffic to join us this afternoon. I'm Nicole Myers, Chief Curatorial and Research Officer here at the DMA, and again, I'm just thrilled to see that everyone has come out for the annual Richard R. Bretel Lecture Series. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize Carol and Roger Horchow for having established an endowment to support this very important lecture series. The Horchows dedicated this annual program to their dear friend, the late Dr. Rick Bretel, in celebration of European art in the DMA's collection from the 19th and 20th centuries. We're joined today by Carol Bretel and some of her friends, many friends of Rick and Factor in the audience, and I'm so pleased again to welcome you here too. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Kimberly Jones, curator of 19th century French paintings at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Kim received her PhD from the University of Maryland, and prior to joining the National Gallery in 1995, she held fellowships at the Musée National du Château de Pau and the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. In DC, Kim has served as a curator and catalog author for a number of exhibitions devoted to French art of the 19th century, including Degas at the Races, a monograph on Edward Vuillard, a show on the artists of the Forest of Fontainebleau, Degas Cassatt, Frederick Bazy and the Birth of Impressionism, and most recently, Degas at the Opera. She is one of a small team of curators that worked on an exhibition that just opened at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris and will travel to Washington, D.C. in September called Paris 1874, The Impressionist Moment. Kim is one of the premier specialists of 19th century French paintings in this country. And not only avant-garde movements like Impressionism, but she also was a specialist of what I like to say is the other side of the coin that's a lot less familiar with American audiences as you don't have the chance to see as much in American museums. And that is the conservative art production that was sanctioned by the French state and was shown at the annual Salon exhibitions. So when I was thinking of who to invite to deliver a Bretel lecture in conjunction with our present exhibition, The Impressionist Revolution from Monet to Matisse, I couldn't think of anyone better to address the complex artistic and social landscape that formed the background of the birth of Impressionism in 1874. I think we're probably the only two people who get really excited these days about salon painting from the 19th century. So I know that we're in for a treat. I can't wait to hear from Dr. Kimberly Jones. So please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Thank you, Nikki, for that wonderful introduction. And actually, my colleague, Mary Morton, who's my, one of my co-curators in the show, also loves salon painting. So there's three of us. Uh, but I won't be talking really about salon painting today. We're going to talk more about Impressionism. So there's a really neat narrative around the birth of Impressionism. Oops, go this way. I mean, rarely does an artistic milestone have such a precise moment where you can say, it began. And arguably with Impressionism, it all began on April 15th, 1874, at 35 Boulevard des Capucines, when the first Impressionist show opened its doors to the public. It's really, I mean, that kind of precision is quite remarkable. And the narrative flows very distinctly from that point. Claude Monet shows Impression Sunrise, the painting that sparked the name Impressionism when one of the critics, Louis Leroy, rather cattily called the artist Impressionist, although, truth be told, he wasn't the only one to use that particular term. From that exhibition, seven artists rise to the fore. Paul Cézanne, Edgar Degas, Claude Monet, Berthe Morisot, Camille Pizarro, Auguste Renoir, and Alfred Sisley. These are the core Impressionists who will move forward and create this art movement that changes the world. It's, again, a really nice, clean narrative. But as we know, it's not always that simple. There's actually a lot more underpinning that history. And maybe it doesn't begin on April 15th. Maybe it begins on December 13th, uh, excuse me, December 31st, 1873. Why? Well, on that day, 22 artists registered a joint stock company called the Anonymous Society of Painters, Sculptors, Engravers, and Lithographers. 
And so what a crazy idea. These artists were creating a stock company where every member basically was a partner. Paid, you bought one um, piece of stock for 61 francs 25, or about $300 in today's dollars. And they created basically a business operation. What makes it so unusual is there were no dealers involved. There were no money men. It was only artists, an organization run by and for artists. Now, some of those 22 original signatories never exhibited with the Impressionists. Um, the sculptor Solari, who was a friend of Cezanne, for example, the painters um, De Brosse and Metling, they might have signed this particular document, but they never came forward. But they had a plan. This was very well organized. They prepared for the possibility of other artists joining their group. Indeed, they were very enthusiastic about welcoming new partners to the firm. Uh, of course, they had to be vetted and approved by an executive committee, which was chaired by Camille Pizarro, and um, Ruout and Monet were also members of that committee. There was a, they would then get input from the supervisory committee, which was headed by Augustin, um, Auguste Autin, as well as Renoir Belliard. And so other artists could join them. They had official um, titles. Otan, for example, was the treasurer. He is the one who collected that 61 franc 25. His son, Lyon, who was a painter, was the secretary. And he is the one who registered the stock firm. So this is how it came about, this very sort of very pragmatic and kind of dull sort of business proposition. Um, but nevertheless, it was a very bold and unusual opportunity, uh, um, undertaking. They set themselves up for their first exhibition in the former studio of the photographer Nadal at 35 the Boulevard des Catucines. Nadal had moved to a, another location. So this is where sort of the magic actually happened. Um, it was a good choice. This particular part of Paris was very fashionable. And of course, it benefited tremendously from the recent project of urban renewal organized by Baron Osman, who introduced the grand boulevards and the beautiful building facades that we are so quintessentially Paris. I mean, the Paris we know today absolutely is a 19th century construction. And in fact, the Impressionists would very much embrace that new Paris and the beauty and, and energy of the, the grand boulevards, as in Monet's painting of the Boulevard des Capucines, which was painted from not our studio window, looking down at the boulevard. So from inside the exhibition space, he created this painting, which was shown in that first Impressionist show. Or Camille Pizarro's painting of the Boulevard is Italien, also painted using that bird's eye perspective. These artists celebrated the hustle and bustle of the street, the dynamism of the pedestrians moving around, the carriages, the omnibuses, the energy, the progress. But there's another Paris that's happening at the same time. And it's the Paris after trauma, the Paris after war, because France was only just beginning to come to terms with and overcome the, the aftermath of what was known as l'année terrible, the year of 1870-71, which began with the disastrous Franco-Prussian War, where France waged war against Prussia and was soundly defeated within the course of months. The city of Paris was laid siege for several months during one of the worst winters in history with people starving and actually reduced to actually eating rat and zoo animals. That was then followed by the introduction of the commune when um, members of the National Guard who had protected Paris joined forces with more progressive members of the working class to establish a liberal government, not the one of, the, of France, but their own government, which lasted very briefly, where they tried to introduce liberal policies of open education, better pay. Unfortunately, the French army came in, and during what became known as the Bloody Week, you had a week of brutal civil war. As many as 15,000 Parisians were killed in the fighting. Major buildings were set ablaze. And these ruins remain. In 1874, the ruins of the Trilouis Palace are still visible on the street. These scars are still present. So when we talk about the birth of Impressionism, we have to keep in mind that it's coming out of this place of trauma, this place of tragedy, that this is very much living memory. And indeed, many artists themselves had been witness to these events and had created art out of those experiences. Edouard Manet, who had served in the National Guard in Paris as um, on the ramparts, 
um, did a number of prints, for example, here, the barricade, showing French Versailles army forces gunning down commune members. I mean, again, Parisian French people turning on French people. It's a shocking civil war. Maxime Lalanne, also a member of the National Guard, painting images of um, the destruction of both the siege and the commune in his prints. And then this painting, because I just always have to show this because it's such a strange thing, by Narcisse Chaillot, showing a rat cellar during the siege of Paris. I mean, this, it, we can laugh about this now and of course enjoy the whimsy of this young boy who's about to fillet a rat. But keep in mind, this is Paris, the grandest city in the world, the center of culinary delights, and they're reduced to eating rat. I mean, that's, that's something that stays with you. You don't, you don't forget that quickly. And so that is part of sort of the social underpinning, sort of what these artists remember and their experience and are still sort of living through in 1874. Now, the other thing, of course, to keep in mind is that salon that Nikki just briefly remembered. The salon was the institution. In the 19th century, it was the largest and most prestigious exhibition of contemporary art of the day. To, ex to succeed as an artist, you needed to succeed at the Salon for that visibility, that clout, the awards, the prizes, the, the, the um, selling, the acquisitions of the art. It was the premier place to see your art get shown. The Impressionists, however, had a very um, problematic relationship with the Salon. The Salon was run by the French government the jury was made up of older artists, many of them members of the academy, who obviously had a vested interest in maintaining tradition, maintaining the rules and standards and style that they themselves had grown up with and embodied and encapsulated. In fact, in 1874, the president of the Salon jury was Joseph, of, um, uh, excuse me, uh, Joseph, um, we shot him blinking on his name, um, who actually had won his first medal in 1824. That's how old and established this guy was. So here you have these younger artists who are trying to do something new, something that's not as familiar. Uh, they did not, they were not winners of the Prix de Rome. They were not touted as great masters of the academic tradition. And they frequently found themselves at odds with the jury. In 1867, the jury was particularly harsh. Were, was it? 2,000 out of 3,000 artists were summarily dismissed. Among them, Claude Monet, his beautiful painting of Women in a Garden, was one of the works rejected in 1867, a fact that led several young artists to actually begin to talk about mounting their own independent exhibition. In fact, Frederick Basile, who was one of them, in a letter to his mother said, we have a plan, we're going to rent out our own space, and we're not going to have juries, we're going to come together, and we're going to have our own exhibition. High-minded words didn't happen, but it was the idea, the germ of it had been, that seed had been planted. Come 1873, six years later, you have another particularly harsh jury uh, with incredibly large numbers of artists being rejected. There was so much outrage, so much protest that reluctantly the state granted a second salon, a salon de refusé. Um, they, they'd done it once before in 1863, which is when um, Manet's Olympia um, very famously um, was the painting du jour that scandalized people. Um, excuse me, not the Olympia, Déjeuner sur l'herbe. And so in 1873, they do another Salon de Rivusé. Only about 400 works were shown. Most artists had learned their lesson that you do not want to be known as a rejected artist. But some, like Auguste Renoir, remained optimistic and exhibited this painting of riding in the Bois de Bologna. But you can see in 1873, yet another sort of slap in the face to these younger artists, another case of the jury being harsh, being arbitrary, and essentially locking the doors, you know, locking them out from the opportunity of showing their art and advancing their careers. And this finally motivated them for what happens in December 31st, 1873, and the creation of the Joint Stock Company, and then the exhibition that happened. Now, when we think Impressionist, we, again, we think of those original seven artists. We think light-filled landscapes. We think scenes of contemporary life. I mean, the beautiful display that um, Nikki has put on in the galleries gives you a real sense of sort of what Impressionism has come to represent. But in 1874, 
There was no Impressionism. There wasn't a movement. There wasn't anything coherent. In fact, there's a lot of eclecticism among the 31 artists who exhibited. There's over 200 works that were shown that year. The exact numbers remain a little um, iffy because certain works were just listed as drawings, so we don't know how many drawings, but at least 218 works were on display that year by 31 different artists, most of whom you probably have never heard of in your life. You're not at fault, by the way. That's, that's the reason. So, for example, here we have two artists could not be farther apart in their approach. And what are their motivations? I mean, why are they exhibiting? Well, in the case of Antoine Ferdinand Attendu, who at 28 years old, excuse me, 29 years old, is one of the youngest artists to exhibit with the Impressionists, obviously it's the opportunity to ex exhibit. That's really what's driving him. He made his debut at the Salon of 1872, was among the Refusés in 1873. So not surprising a young, aspiring artist sees an opportunity to exhibit, he grabs it with both hands. And so he does indeed exhibit with them, although he also is showing at the Salon that same year, he shows a still life of oysters, and he shows four works in the First Impression show, including this absolutely ravishing pastel of a still life with pheasants. If you come to Washington, you will get to see it. It's absolutely gorgeous. I had never seen it in person, and it is really quite beautiful. So he was putting his best foot forward. But after 74, he never shows at the Impressionists again. He goes back to the Salon in 1875 and cheerfully exhibits there for the rest of his career, showing domestic kitchen still lives. That's sort of his thing. Then you have a different artist. You have Auguste Otta, who I'd mentioned earlier. At 63 years of age, he is one of the oldest artists to participate in the first Impressionist show. And as I mentioned, he was part of the supervisory committee and the treasurer. But he also came from a very different background. He was an academic artist. He had studied at French Academy. He won the Prix de Rome, which allowed him to spend three years working in Italy and studying, which is where he made this bust of um, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang, who was the, um, the head of the Villa Medicis in Rome, uh, sort of the artist who in, actually embodies uh, the sort of classical ideals and the academic tradition. Otan was the recipient of many state um, commissions. One of his most famous is actually he did the wonderful sculpture of um, Galatea and Polyphemus, this in the um, Tuileries Garden, it still exists today, one of his most important works. But he also was essentially a socialist. He had very clear, he was very liberal in his politics, and he became involved in the commune. And he also became part of the Federation des Arts, the artists who essentially set themselves up during the commune to sort of oversee affairs of art, the most famous of whom is Gustave Courbet. After the fall of the commune, many of the people who participated in the commune, um, they, they suffered greatly. Many of them were uh, imprisoned. Many were transported, were sent actually to the French colonies. Otan avoided that fate, but he found those commissions that he'd had before, they dried up. He had no more state sponsorship for obvious reasons. So that combined with his personal politics, that he was very liberal-minded, very progressive, made him a very willing and enthusiastic participant in the first Impressionist show, where he became the sculptor of that anonymous society of painters, sculptors, and printmakers. He was the only sculptor in the group. Showed several sculptures, including this bust of, um, of Ang. He never exhibited with the Impressionists again either. This was just this one moment in time. Now, other artists were much more fluid in their rationale. Many of them were moved by friendship. Not surprisingly, Edgar Degas was a particularly avid recruiter for the group. He actually had a quite considerable friends network, and he brought in a lot of these other artists, one of them being Giuseppe De Nittis, a young Italian artist, very fashionable artist who'd actually had been doing very successful, doing well the, the salon, showing paintings of high life uh, in Paris, as well as later in London and, and in his own Italy for Barletta. Degas had met him in Italy, and they developed a friendship, so he invited Denitis, who agreed to exhibit. I think Degas, Degas was expecting Denitis to bring a little that star power. You know, his, he was a very fashionable, very successful artist. Uh, these are two paintings that he showed at the Salon of 1874. The one on the left will be coming uh, to Washington. Unfortunately, he did not show these. He actually showed fairly minor works, a beautiful engraving of a woman, and a wonderful series of studies of the eruption of Vesuvius, which he actually witnessed. Uh, they're very beautiful pieces, but they don't quite have the same, you know, star power that 
the painting of How Cold did, which was one of the great Salon stars. Another Degas recruit and friend was Edward Brandon, another young artist that Degas had met during his time in Italy. Uh, Brandon was Jewish, actually, along with Camille Pizarro, the only, one of two Jewish artists who exhibit the Impressionists. And he had actually, while he was in Italy, of all things, he was decorating the, the church of St. Bridget of Sweden, a Catholic church in Rome, because he volunteered to do it for free, and they said, okay, sure. But when he returns to France in 1873, he begins to devote himself to scenes of Jewish life, and particularly Jewish religious life. So very much a surprising thing to see in that first Impressionist show. Brandon was also a patron of Degas. He owned three works by Degas that were shown in the 1874 exhibition, including the dancing class, uh, the small, beautiful painting on the right that you see here that belongs to the Met. Now, keep in mind, there were real reputational risks for these artists. That, there were real challenges of leap, this, making this leap of faith, exhibiting with this ragtag, random, eclectic group of artists who had no sort of standing, many of whom had a very fraught relationship, Enter, for example, Berta Moiso. Of all of the impressions, she actually had the most successful track record at the Salon. She'd shown there eight times. Although her art had never garnered a lot of attention, the fact that she consistently managed to be shown showed that she actually was sort of on the right footing, that she was on the right path for Salon success. Edgar Degas invited both Berta and her sister Edma, who had trained as an artist to exhibit, only Berta took up the challenge. Again, this was a great risk for her, both as a, a moderately successful salon painter as well as a woman. Her friend Edward Manet was very much opposed to her participation. He warned her and cautioned her against it, but he did. Manet was also um, asked to enjoy the Impressionists, and he refused. Degas rather scoffed that he was more vain than courageous in his stance by refusing to exhibit the Impressionists, although ironically he was pretty consistently, his name kept coming up in reviews of the Impressionist show, even though he wasn't there, so he was still branded as an Impressionist no matter what he did. But Manet had a different stance. He believed you want to change the system, you do it from within, not from the fringes. He thought the battlefield was the salon itself, so you needed to keep showing up, showing your work, being your authentic self, and you took the hits that came with it. So the, the Railway, a painting that we consider very avant-garde, very forward-looking, was shown at the Salon, where it was, in fact, a lightning rod for criticism and uh, co comics and caricatures, or at least five caricatures of this particular painting. So they had, the critics had a field day with it, but he held firm. Uh, Polichinelle was also accepted, but he also had to deal with rejection because these two paintings were refused in 1874. So he could have actually shown them, I guess, with the Impressionists, had he been so inclined. <coughs> His pupil, Eva Gonzalez, took the same stance. She too would fight her way through in the Salon. She had been rejected in 1873 and showed at the Salon de Refusé, but in 1874 she tried her luck with mixed results. Her beautiful pastel of the pink morning gown was accepted, but her painting of at the box at the Théâtre des Italiens was refused. So what, what is the rationale with the jury? We don't know. Now, other artists fared a little better on both sides. And it's important to keep in mind that over time, this notion has come with good reason that there is a clear bifurcation between Impressionists, the avant-garde on one side, and the Salon, it's the rear guard on the other. And partly this has to do with the impression themselves. In later years, they actually established the policy that if you exhibited at the Salon, you could not exhibit with the Impressionists that year. They made that very clear. But in 1874, there was no such rule. In fact, of the 31 artists who exhibited in the first Impressionist show, 12 of them, more than a third, exhibited in both shows. Giuseppe Genitis, Attendu, who I mentioned, Eugène Boudin, Stanislas Lepine, and also one of my favorites, Ludovic Lepic exhibited in both exhibitions, multiple works, including this, this mammoth triptych of the biblical flood, which we have, the, only the two um, wings still exist, and they are enormous. They are really very imposing and very, very beautiful. The middle panel and a crowning lunette, sadly, have been lost. And then in the Impressionist show, he showed three really beautiful prints, including this absolutely adorable puppy of Jupiter, which I, which I adore. It's a beautiful, beautiful print. So again, a lot of flexibility, and also he too was another Degas recruit, I should, should mention that. Now, going back to Degas, 
There was another aspect of sort of the motivation behind all of these artists, and that is the question of display. Now, at this, um, just before the Salon of 1870 opened, Degas actually published an open letter to the Salon jury, which was published in a journal called Paris Journal, a Paris Journal, on April 12, 1870. There is one thing to which every exhibitor has an indisputable right, he said, and which has never been well discussed or written proposals in council meetings. It's a place to one's liking. It already exists in industry. A bookmaker, however small a space he is given, can display as he pleases, not a painter. This idea of how your art gets shown, it's not just a matter of crossing the threshold, getting accepted, that was one hurdle. But there were other hurdles that, that awaited you, and that was how your art was shown. Now, Degas and the Impressionists had good reason to be concerned about how their art was shown. Um, <coughs> what you see on the left, this is actually a digital reconstruction of what Nadar's studio might have looked like. You already get an immediate sense of the scale. It's, it's, an, it's a commercial space, first and foremost, but it's small. It's intimate. You can see that by the size of the doorways. You can also see how the paintings are hung, basically row of a grid of, of six, two rows, contrasted to the salon, which were giant, enormous spaces with vaulted ceilings, with paintings hung from the rail all the way up to the ceiling. I mean, it's, and paintings hung brick, you know, there was no coherency. They were actually hung alphabetically, so no, no concern of style, of, of Subject matter, you know, if, you were, if your name began with a B, this is your gallery. This is where you're going. Oh, you're M? You're over there. And considering the Salon of 1874, there were 3,700 works. I mean, it's enormous. The scale of it, you cannot even begin to imagine. And contrast that again to 200-ish. So this was what Degas wanted to fight about. Now, in his, in his letter, he makes a couple of really interesting points. He specifically said, only hang two rows of paintings and leave an interval of at least 20 to 30 centimeters between, which you can sort of see this. And keep in mind, this is much more how we hang paintings today. We don't hang floor to ceiling the way they did in the 19th century. We hang things at a more reasonable scale with distance to allow paintings to breathe rather than having them all literally just crammed up against one another as they were at the salon. He also proposed using small screens screen, hanging them on screen, small and large. He also said the drawings would be pulled from their desert and integrated with paintings, which they deserve, which was another point, a fact, of the, how things were installed in, in these exhibitions. Everything was segregated. Paintings were in the big galleries, sculptures were in the garden below, and then there was essentially a corridor that ran outside the painting galleries, overlooking the sculpture galleries, where they stuck all the works on paper. They sort of put them all in right there. So there was no kind of sort of connection. And obviously for Degas in particular, who was a great draftsman and who did exhibit a pastel in the first Impressionist show, he cared very deeply about this, as did his colleagues. There were, in fact, works by printmakers, uh, not just that one, the Le Piques that I mentioned before and the Denitis, but also Felix Brackmond. Brackmond exhibited 33 prints in the first Impressionist show, and he would continue to exhibit with the Impressionists for years to come, and exhibiting these really wonderful works, many of them sort of, you know, sort of a nice treatise on art history, which is how we were approaching the installation in Washington. There were also watercolors. Uh, Zachary Astruc, who also was another of those artists who exhibited at the Salon, showed a dozen beautiful watercolors in the first impression. It showed these very, very um, detailed, very delicate, complex, very dense watercolors. Berta Morisot also showed two watercolors in that first year. And then, of course, there were pastels, like the Attendu I showed before, but also pastels by Eugène Boudin and Claude Monet. These were not separated out and segregated out. They lived and existed alongside paintings. And again, I'm showing you another um, of the reconstructed galleries of the Impressionist show, where you can see these actually are some of the pa pastels that we think. We do not, the pastels are literally seascape. So identifying them, is a, it was a bit of a challenge, but so we, we had to have a little license. But you can see the pastels were hung with paintings. And this is what I'm talking about. This is a view of the sculpture gallery on the far right showing the salon. So here's where the sculpture is. And this up here 
This is where drawings were shown. And those awnings are sort of protecting them to some extent by light. So you can see they're kind of ghettoized in, in the salon, whereas with the Impressionists, they were really put in a place where they deserve to be. Oops. I really should have, I should have duplicated the slide. Now, the other thing that Degas talked about was you know, where things hung, not just how in the two categories, but he also said any exhibitor will, um, the artist will designate where their paintings are to appear. The detestable picture rail, the source of all our agreements, uh, disagreements, will no longer be given as a favor or assigned randomly, but ra assigned randomly. What did he mean by that? Well, you have this picture rail, which is, you can't really see very well in this, um, basically about four feet high. So the paintings that are hung directly above that rail are I, I, sight line. And this was what we call being held, hung on the line. This was the premier spot. Because if you're hung at eye level, everyone can see your art, everyone can enjoy it. If you had the misfortune of being hung high, what was known as being skied, no one could see your art. So it's almost as bad as being refused. Because if people can't see your art, they can't appreciate it, they can't buy it. So this idea of like, rather than the, the sort of the rail line being for the prestigious artists, the people who were favored and friends of the jury, that everyone got that opportunity was again, a really bold idea, the sort of democratic approach to exhibition display. Now, of course, there was another motivation behind all of this, and that's money. Now, Let's not be crass. Let's be very pragmatic about this and very realistic. Artists wanted to be paid. And in order to sell you art, it had to be seen. Visibility was chief. That's why the Salon, which essentially had a stranglehold on exhibition, was so essential. It was, in many ways, the only place to show your art. It was the grand annual event. It was the one, your one chance to have your art be seen. And if your art could be seen, it could obviously get the very practical you know, and obvious you know, rewards. You could get a medal. You could be purchased by the state. And if you're really, really lucky, have your painting hung in the Luxembourg Museum, which was the Museum of Contemporary Art in the 19th century. It was the greatest honor. You couldn't enter the Louvre until 20 years after you were dead, so you had to wait. This is where you sort of, this is your holding room before you could actually Hopefully, if you were really lucky, go on to loop. Even so, there was cachet. There was cachet in that sort of uh, status. Most artists, of course, would not ever have a work acquired by the state, would never actually see their works hung in the Luxembourg Museum. You know, we'll talk about the, the impressions is a whole other matter, but that's a different uh, story for another day. Uh, but you could actually find seller, you find buyers. There was, in the second half of the 19th century, a very robust and increasing market for art being purchased by a more middle class audience. It wasn't just, you know, for so much of history, it was the church and the state. They were the main acquirers of art and the very, very wealthy. Art was becoming a little more accessible with the rise of the middle class. And so you wanted your art to be shown as a way of getting it out there to the world to be seen by artists. Now, the Impressionists understood this. They understood the, the very clear link between display, and sale. If you wanted to survive and thrive as an artist, you wanted to be professional, you had to pay the bills. And it also was a measure of your success. So the Impressionists decided they would also use this exhibition as an opportunity to sell their art. There were 102 works that were um, intended for sale. And this you're actually seeing, this is a, a copy of an annotated catalog that actually has all the prices, which were not published in the catalog per se. These are handwritten notes. Um, to sort of give a sense of sort of what kinds of prices they were, were asking. It's very interesting that Bertha Morisot was actually pretty modest in her pricing compared to Monet, who was uh, a little more aspirational, shall we say. Um, the work, you know, the, he has, um, for example, the painting, The, the Luncheon, uh, which he had marked as 5,000 francs. Uh, this, that was a pretty ambitious price to be had, but he felt very confident that it was a reasonable price for this painting. It's a very large um, interior scene, which I'm very happy was not in Paris, but will be in Washington, so you'll get to see it there. It was also a painting that was rejected from the Salon of 1870. 
So this exhibition offered an opportunity for Monet to present this painting, which obviously was very important to him, which was a major investment of time and energy that he very consciously, it's also a little bit of an outlier when you see the other things. When you think Impression Sunrise, this you do not think in the same, you know, it's sort of the same sort of moment. Um, and in the career, they weren't. They were different points in his career, but still, he thought enough of this painting to include it in the first impression to show. The second most expensive painting offered for sale is Auguste Renoir's The Parisian Girl, which was offered for 3,500 francs. Um, that's actually a pretty, you know, pretty nice price. It's also a very large painting as well. Well, perhaps it will come as a shock to no one that of the 102 works, only 98, well, excuse me, 98 did not sell. Only four paintings sold in that first um, show. Um, one by Latouche, uh, Louis Latouche, one by Renoir, one by Sisley, and one by Monet, the aforementioned Impression Sunrise, which was purchased by his friend and um, very um, devoted collector, um, Ernest Ochede. All four paintings were purchased for the price of 1,000 francs. So it gives you a better sense of sort of where these, these artists were fitting the market. And it should be noted that Impression Sunrise actually was purchased after the show closed. So it didn't even sell during the exhibition. So it really was, you know, a disappointment. And in fact, the exhibition was kind of a disappointment all around. Uh, they didn't sell much art. The attendance, the visitation numbers were not what they had hoped for. They charged 50 centimes to enter the exhibition. And you had to go through a turnstile. I mean, this is very, very modern. Um, over the course of a month, they only had about 3,500 visitors. Um, to sort of give you a sense of scale, the Paris Salon, which runs for two months, so it is twice as long, had upwards of 500,000 visitors. So, and the Salon had the, uh, excuse me, the Impressionist Show had the advantage, it had evening hours. The Salon actually closed at 6 p.m. It did not have any evening hours where the Impressionist Show was open from 10 a.m. to 6, um, 6 p.m. and then would have evening hours as well. Um, the sales of the catalog that were published, similar, similar disappointing news. Uh, the Impressionists sold only 320 catalogs, which were sold for the price of one franc each, uh, the price of half a rat, if you want to put it in that context, um, versus the 48,766 catalogs that were sold for the first, for the salon of that year. So, not, again, by that metric, not good. Um, it also proved to be a, a complete financial disaster in other ways. Cost for the exhibition ballooned. They had to pay 2,000 francs to rent Nadar studio, and then there were other costs involved, obviously the printing of the catalog, getting the turnstile, and everything else. By the time it was done, they were actually 3,713 francs in the hole. Um, so it's actually every member, every partner in the joint stock company ended up having to pay 184,000 francs 50 out of pocket or about $900 by today's standard, which is three times as much as they had to pay to be partners so they could exhibit. So not a good thing and you will not, again, not be surprised to learn that the company was disbanded by a unanimous vote on December 17, 1874. The Anonymous Society of the Painters, Sculptors, and Printmakers was no more. It obviously had come to a rather ignominious end. But we also know the story doesn't end there. It continues on. For example, in 1874, across, you know, a mile away at the Salon, other artists were on view. Mary Cassatt and Marie Braquemond were exhibiting at the Paris Salon in that year both of whom would join the Impressionists in 1879 and would become very devoted and engaged members in the group. So their numbers would continue to build. In their next um, Impressionist exhibition, 1876, for example, Gustav Kayabat joined. So despite these uh, this sort of uneven beginnings, a rough start they had, uh, they would over time overcome this. They would become more confident. They'd become a little less eclectic. And of course, you know, the money part, remember that? Um, I think we know how that turned out as well. Uh, Monet, you know, easily fetching $110 million, Cezanne, even more than that. Um, history has shown that their works are worth a lot more than the thousand francs that they were earning back in 1874. And of course, perhaps the best um, evidence of their success 
are the exhibitions. I'm showing you, these are two photographs um, from the opening at Musée d'Orsay. I, I wish I'd actually done some more photographs. The one on the right, if you've been to Paris and seen the Musée d'Orsay, on the plaza outside, they have a line. It snakes around, as they often do. This is down the Rue de Lille. This went all the way down the street. These are people getting to go into the museum. Now, I'm not saying they were all there to see my exhibition. I would, I would. But they were there for the museum that's devoted to Impressionism. They were there for the Impressionists. And I can't help but think that could Monet, even in his most fevered imaginations, would he ever have considered that there might come a time where people would stand four deep just so they could get a photograph of Impression Sunrise? Could he have ever imagined that level of fame, that this painting that had you know, caused such you know, sort of a shock in 1874 had led to such criticism that now I, I, someone recently told me, I think properly described it as the Mona Lisa of Impressionism. Could he ever have dreamed that something like that would happen? I don't think they could have. So, and at the end, the Impressionists have the last laugh. They might have been criticized, they might have been mocked, they might have uh, impoverished themselves in their endeavors to show their art to the public, but with time, they triumphed. And we are here today because of that very bold endeavor they made in 1874. So, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to take some questions. I know there's going to be people with... If you wouldn't mind, please raise your hand if you have a question, and us two will come around. The subscription agreement to the Societe Anonymous, uh, after the names there were numerals and free, free that, was, that was their street addresses. That was what? So that's had, had their street address. Yeah, sorry, it's very hard to see, it's very small. <laughs> First of all, oops, loud. thank you for coming and pronouncing all these words in such beautiful <laughs> language. I wish you would do more of that. Uh, my question is, when, did the salon, the salon, did it uh, continue or did it ever just disband? The salon continued actually it still continued well into the 20th century, but it was, it was very much in its decline. It was still, you know, it was still very popular with people. I mean, it had one advantage that it had two free days, so you know, it was a good time with the, the kids and the fam on a Sunday, you know, go to see the salon, see the art. But over time, it lost a lot of its allure, partly because increasingly there were more of these independent exhibitions. More and more, there was more opportunity, more art, more interesting things happening outside the salon. So, it continued to sort of, you know, roll along, but it's interesting, the following year, 1875, the attendance numbers dropped, had lower attendance, lower catalog sales, so it's already beginning. So, as I said, in 1874, you know, salon's here, impression isn't there, but over time, that, that, that changes quite a bit. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm so curious about the catalogs. What is the point of the catalogs? Is it just a list of, of the items so people could tick the boxes that they wanted to take home with them? or Because I'm assuming these weren't photographs of right. each individual piece. Obviously, that predates the technology. So, yeah. Sure. Well, more. the catalog, I mean, there are no labels. There are no wall labels in these rooms. So you don't know what you're actually seeing. So the catalog was partly so you would have a record. It's, it's probably more useful when you go to the, see the salon with the 3,000 objects. All they have are numbers. So you see a, a number on the frame. If you want to know who painted it and what the title was, and if, for example, you wanted to know, oh, I want to buy this, where does the artist live? Oh, there's his address in the catalog. So it really was for that purpose. And then there's actually a couple pages in the back where usually where it was blank, you'd write notes to yourself. So that was sort of the purpose. Now we give wall labels, so you don't have to worry about buying the catalog if you don't want to. Hi, uh, first, thank you very much for coming and thank you to the organizers. I think we all really enjoyed this. My question was about um, these artists later in their life as future movements came like pointillism, um, 
expressionism, all these other things, were these artists open to that or were they similarly critical as their predecessors have been critical of them? Or was there something kind of innate in this group that remained open to new art as it progressed? It was, it was a mixed bag of how these artists responded. Uh, for example, Degas got a lot of heat from, there was a lot of contention in the later years among the impressions about who should exhibit with them. Degas invited a lot of his realist friends like Raffaelli, but he also invited Paul Gauguin. Georges Seurat exhibited in the 1886, the final Impressionist show. So some artists were very open to these new movements and really wanted to support them. Others just sort of just did their own thing and didn't pay attention. Sometimes they didn't like them. Mary Cassatt, for example, was very, you know, very dismissive of Cezanne. She actually encouraged her friend Louisine Havemeyer, you know, Cezanne, get, get rid of his paintings. They're, they're not good. He's not, he's, not, he's not worth it. So, you know, so it, it, it was, the response was as varied as, and unique as each of the artists themselves. I had a question about the um, dealers. Like, when did the, the dealers, like Volar, come into play in all of this and start selling the Impressionist pictures themselves? Yeah. Oh, the dealers were already on the scene. So Paul durand Ruel was really the big Impressionist dealer. And this also became a bit of a complicated thing because durand Ruel, France has sort of been struggling financially after the Franco-Prussian War. And so at one point he had to had a sold a lot of his precious paintings at auction and they, they bought really bad prices, really low, which of course was disastrous for these artists. You're, you want your prices to go up constantly. But Duran Royal was definitely there. In fact, we actually, I think, as Americans, I think we owe a big debt of gratitude to Paul Duran Royal, who in 1886 hosted the first Impressionist show in New York, which proved to be enormously successful. Americans loved Impressionism from the jump. And so he was, he was very active. He, you know, he started Barbizon Art, but he was buying and selling Impressionist works in the 70s. And of course, then you also have Vollard in particular and other dealers coming along as they began to recognize um, who it was. But at this point, 1874, it's kind of Durand Rowe was the only one who really was willing to take that gamble. Around this same time period, I understand that there are these, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, animalaires or whatever, these, they did a lot of bronzes of animals, and I understand that they were actually more valuable than these, paint, than these paintings. Is that true? And what happened to those guys that were so famous at the time? Yeah. Oh, so many things that were valuable at this time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, people like Berry and Frémier and those sculptures, which were hugely popular, salon paintings, like you know, paintings by Jerome. I didn't talk about Jerome. We're actually in Washington. Our first opening gambit is Impression Sunrise and Jerome's Eminence Grise, which won the Grand Medal of Honor. I mean, Jerome's were fetching extraordinary princely sums at the Salon. And now Jerome, he's had a bit of research since a recent year, but a lot of these paintings that went for fabulous prices in the 19th century. If you look at, if you can see photographs of sort of the homes of really wealthy, American industrialists, and they're hung with all these salon paintings, which now, you know, are worth nothing because tastes change. You know, something that went for 10,000 francs in 1875, you know, wouldn't be going for a comparable price today. And again, it's just because tastes change and some, some things hold value better than others, but it's all arbitrary at the end. It's what you're willing to pay for a painting or a sculpture. Done with questions? Okay. I came in just a few minutes late. I apologize. Did you talk about what's going on at the National Gallery of Art? Do you want to talk to us about this exhibition that you have going on? I didn't, but I'd be very happy to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yes, so this exhibition, Paris, um, 1874, The Impressionist Moment, um, is a co production with the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, we were just opened last month and will be coming to Washington in um, September 8th through January 19th. So you've got four months during which to see it. Uh, includes 130, actually, no, we, we trimmed 125 works, um, including many works that were in First Impression Show, but also in the Salon of 1874. Because with small exceptions, we have one room devoted to the Franco-Prussian War. But apart from that room, everything you will see in this exhibition was on view in the spring of 1874. 
So we, you know, we tried our best to reconstruct the first impression show as much as we could, but it's hard. There are things that are really, we, we couldn't track down or we couldn't get for various reasons. And obviously we were not gonna have 3,700 3, salon works, <laughs> but we did want to give people a real sense. So these are the things that if you were a visitor to Paris in spring of 1874, you could have seen these things. You could have experienced them firsthand. And unlike some earlier you know, exhibitions about the Impressionist show, which tended to focus on the big seven, you know, the major names, and the paintings, it's an exhibition that really tries to also really pay homage to the diversity, complexity, eclecticism of the First Impressionist show by including some of the lesser known names like Astruc and Le Pic and works of different media. So it gives, I think, I hope, uh, a better understanding of kind of what that first enterprise was really all about, how sort of catch as catch can it was. There was no, there was no clear aesthetic through line. There was no sort of stylistic element that united all of these artists. We think of those things. The subjects are, are not unified. There's nothing unified. It was basically 31 artists who said, I want to show my art. I want to decide what I want to show, and I want to decide how I'm going to show it. Although in the end, it was actually Renoir who kind of did the installation. So, you know, they kind of all, all bailed on him and left him behind to sort of holding the bag. But all of these artists had that same, I want to show my art and I want to control how I show my art and how people see it and, and experience it. Thank you. All right, yes, uh, two questions. One, how many works were submitted? It was actually over, I, I, I can't remember the exact number. It's in the catalogs, I wrote that essay. It was over 5,400, and they weren't all paintings. It's also paintings, works on paper, sculptures, various things. That's, there's that story that there was an R stamped on the reverse of the canvas. I have never seen that R. No one I have ever talked to has ever seen that R. Did it exist? I don't know. The, the story is always told that refuse paintings got stamped with an R for refusé, and they carried that like the you know the scarlet letter throughout their life. I have never, and no one to my knowledge has ever said I've actually seen one with my own eyes. So that it's interesting. It's a curious story. So if any of you ever seen one or heard of anyone, please direct them to me. I'd love to know. In the uh, uh, first four paintings that were shown, you or sold, pardon me, you gave the price in French francs. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea of what that would be worth in US dollars today? Let's see, so <laughs> if 61 francs was, um, was it 200, what did I say? I wrote this down. Um, it's, I probably should have looked that up. You're absolutely right. Um, if someone has a, a calculator and wants to do the math for me, so it was, so 61 franc 25 was $300. So 3,000, maybe $5,000 today's not money. It's not, it's not a ton of money, but again, also have to, the thing you can't factor in is inflation and how much things cost. I mean, $5,000 in 1874 went a lot farther than $5,000 does in 2024, so it's, it's, always, it's always challenging to sort of do those kinds of translations, but, but you know, I mean, when, when you won a medal at the, the Salon, the, the um, gold medal actually came with a thousand dollar stipend, so a thousand francs stipend, so it was a, a decent amount of money. But, and, you know, again, that's 500 rats, so. That, that would, I think that's going to be our usual now um, point of conversion for anything, is how many rats would that be? Any more questions? Um, hello, thank you. I was going to ask about um, the framing because I saw in the re I mean the reconstruction, the frames are extremely simple, and of course today they're very often presented in elaborate 18th century style frames or 18th century frames. And I'm wondering how and when did that evolution take place? Um, it took place in a couple ways. I mean, some artists were more committed to Sort of the aesthetics of their framing. I mean, some were very explicit and very finicky about how they wanted their art shown more than others. 
But this 18th century frame, a lot of that has to do with the dealers, and particularly in the early 20th century. Dealers came up with this notion that Americans in particular liked 18th century style frames. And that, that actually would get them a higher price. And so a lot of original 19th century frames, oftentimes which were a lot simpler, got chucked aside and replaced with these more elaborate 18th century frames because that was what dealers believed was the American taste. And that's what Americans wanted and that would raise the price. So that's, that's a big part of the reason. How, I mean, those were not the frames that these artists would have wanted. They may not have wanted necessarily a very bare strip frame, but they definitely would not have wanted something as sort of frou-frou as an 18th century frame. And when you change the frame, it's really remarkable what, what it does to the painting. Thank you. Oh, one more, all the way. We've got time for... You just have to wait for me to go all the way up these <laughs> stairs. <laughs> So you said that these wonderful artists would be so surprised to see people standing in line. How do you attribute the magic of Impressionism? <laughs> I feel like I should have Nikki answer that question for us. I, I think a lot of it is there is a accessibility to Impressionism. I mean, you know, people might sort of scoff at, oh, it's pretty landscapes, but there's something there's an immediacy to them. I mean, a lot of salon painting had complicated narratives and they, there was a higher bar for entry to these things. These are paintings that are beautiful, that they are acceptable, they're comprehensible. There's a, a joy to a lot of them. I mean, think about, again, keep these paintings at 1874, I mean, they're coming out of a period of trauma and yet these paintings are really joyful in many respects. And I think Right now, sort of, there's so much talk, particularly with contemporary art, that art needs to have a message, that art needs to sort of address hard-hitting issues. It needs to be political, it needs to be social, it needs to do something. And sometimes art just needs to be. Art just needs to be beautiful. And I think there's something utterly charming about these paintings. I will, I will always defend Impressionism, but I will always defend it as a great American art form because Americans were, you know, we were such early and avid adapters of Impressionism. While only the elite few in Paris were buying Impressionism, the Americans were lapping it up. Americans connected with it. And so it's a painting that speaks to us and has always been part of our history. And they're paintings that we see, that we're familiar with. And yes, they have to a certain extent been a little, you know, you know, obviously overly commercialized, you know. Every dorm room has a poster of an Impressionist painting. Every chocolate box, I mean, there, you know, there's that familiarity breeding attempt, but at the same time, they exist because people love them and people connect with them and enjoy them. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying art just because it's beautiful and you love it. Thank you. Thank you all so very much, and if you haven't done so, please do check out the exhibition. Have a great rest of your Saturday. <laughs>